Hello. Today in 2515, we're going to be speaking about the social influences in the creation of leisure. We'll be first speaking about social processes that influence leisure. And then we'll be looking at uh, critical influences on leisure orientations in childhood, including uh, family and peers. For the next lecture, we'll move on to uh, the influence of media and technology among in childhood. And then looking at the social influences on leisure in um, adulthood. So there's various uh, social processes that are influencing leisure. Um, it's important for you to understand each of these and to be able to distinguish them. For example, uh, you know, in a multiple choice uh, question, uh, in order to be able to understand which of these processes is happening, for example, in a scenario. So first is imitation and modeling. So we've talked about models before um, when we talked about ways of increasing self-efficacy. So a model is a person being imitated, um, the person like a role model setting an example. And this person may be imitated intentionally um, or unintentionally, meaning that uh, you could be a role model, a model for people and you're, you know you are like being an instructor, a coach, you know, being in a position of um, teaching or power over someone, a parent, <laughs> uh, or, or it could be unintentionally. Um, so you're not really knowing that you're being imitated. Um, and, you know, that happens all the time. That's how humans learn is we uh, watch uh, others. Models are usually older, familiar, and attractive in some way. Um, that ne doesn't necessarily mean physical. Um, attraction, um, and have status associated with a level of competence that the person who's imitating them appreciates. So especially, you know, in childhood, obviously, parents are often models. Siblings um, could be like uh, older uh, neighbors. For example, my children, you know, uh, really look up to older neighbors um, and uh, also older cousins in particular. Um, you know, as role models. Friends could be their peers, uh, teachers, coaches, athletes, and entertainers. And I want to emphasize that the influence of models doesn't end in childhood. Adults are obviously, um, you know, look at role models as well. Um, we might not quite think of it quite the same, but we too have um, models. You know, for example, um, when I was having children, you know, I certainly looked um, up to family and friends as role models, people who had older children, you know, as a way of role modeling their parenting style. So for each of these social influences, we need to understand the influence on leisure. And obviously leisure choice can be impacted or affected by significant role models. And this can be impacted positively or negatively. For example, positive behaviors, you know, you're modeling healthy behaviors, healthy leisure choices. Um, for example, we know that parents, you know, if uh, for, for children, if their parent or parents are physically active, um, that that's a, certainly a role model and children then are more likely once they reach adulthood and it's around seven uh, times more likely to be physically active in adulthood if their parents were active. It can also be negative uh, role modeling, modeling unhealthy and risky leisure. Uh, you know, for example, smoking um, and smoking in a way can for some is can be associated as a leisure activity. Um, but it is, you know, if you, we know that, for example, if parents are smokers, the child is, I think, you know, it's more like 70%, you know, times more greater to smoke themselves in adulthood, even if they have negative attitudes towards um, smoking. So 
And I'm sure all of you, for example, when you're writing your term paper, you might be thinking about the influence, uh, positive or negative, that role models had on your leisure. For example, I've um, in your reflections and that sort of thing, I've read, you know, after see people talking about the influence of, you know, their parents on their leisure activities. For example, um, if you grew up in a family where, um, you know, your let's say your father played hockey his whole life, and you know now is a coach, you're obviously more likely to be in to be attracted than to hockey um, due to the modeling of your parent. Another influence on leisure with imitation and modeling is, you know, children's leisure interests are very much strongly related to those of their parents. And we've uh, talked about this already on the previous slide. Actions really speak louder than words. Um, really not until you're, parent, you're a parent you really understand how much children imitate you um you know i the way they stand the way they say things um you know i uh, i can even hear you know they're pretending to speak on the phone and they are using you know the same language um for example my um my son, my six-year-old, wanted to practice uh, using the phone the other day, so he used my cell phone to to call our house line to speak to his brother, and I could hear my husband. He's like, "Hey, how are you doing, bro?" I, you know exactly what uh, my husband would be saying to his brothers. Um, so, you know, uh, we are human. Uh, humans really absorb; they're just sponges, really. Another problem or influence, though, on leisure is there can be lack of role models, um, and that can serve as a constraint to leisure and, you know, many things in life. For example, perhaps um, you uh, are, you know, your family ancestry is from Asia, you've grown up in Canada, um, and, you know, you don't see an Asian hockey player on TV. Um, in other sports, there are but I, I can't think of uh, one in, on, in hockey. So because of that lack of role model, it might mean that um, there is, you know, uh, someone thinks that they cannot do a certain activity because there are no role models. And of course, this is a big issue um, for girls and for women throughout history, lack of role models. And this is, of course, less and less and less. Um, and, you know, for example, in um, the American election campaigns, we have, you know, a incoming vice president who said, you know, she needs to be a role model as someone who is a visible minority, a woman and an immigrant to, you know, uh, the, the U.S. Um, she made a point of saying that um, the little girls needed to see her on the TV and remember that point in history. Persuasion is also a social influence. Persuasion is very similar to modeling. Um, but in, in this case, obviously, um, it, in role modeling, the person might not even know they're being a role model or might not put a lot of effort into it. Whereas persuasion, obviously, the person persuade is trying to get someone to do a, a specific thing, or at least they're influencing their thoughts. And when it, when it comes to this, persuasion is really about communication. So the communicator's attractiveness, credibility, and credibility is like competence and trustworthiness, it really influences the ability to effectively persuade. You know, for example, think of, you know, health campaigns, physical activity campaigns, etc. You know, they often have um, people who are um, known in society, usually like someone who is, um, you know, a Canadian athlete or uh, a singer or something like that. Um, and that then the reason they do that is because um, they're attractive and um, kind of the people perceive them to be trustworthy. Um, the message of the persuasion is important. Obviously, um, you know, if it appeals to logic or emotion, but it's very important when we, you know, if we are trying to persuade others, and obviously uh, 
that is what we're all learning is really how to get people to be physically active, to be socially engaged, to be healthy, have good quality of life. We do have persuasion. We do have a message. But we also have to make sure that it's not perceived as manipulation or co coercion because we know when you're forcing, when someone views that they're being forced, that they have lack of choice, then you have psychological reactance and that can reduce self-determination. Then we have conformity as a social influence and one that can impact leisure. So conformity is simply a change in a person's behavior resulting from real or imagined pressure from a person or group of people. You know, where you're trying to conform to at least what you perceive to be the norm or, or what someone is wanting you to do. Um, and, you know, people conform really for two reasons. First is wanting to belong, wanting to be liked, and also wanting to be right. As humans, we want to feel social belonging. So it's kind of, I don't know if you've heard the saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Um, you know, I, and obviously conformity can be positive uh, or negative. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking, you know, here I have an image here of, you know, peer pressure. Obviously, conformity is a lot about peer pressure, and this is a lot uh, to do in childhood. So, I mean, in, pardon me, in uh, adolescence. So in adolescence, there can be a lot, uh, especially with leisure, either the trying to conform to negative behaviors or unhealthy behaviors. And there's also can be the positive, though, conforming to positive and healthy behaviors. There's different people who are you know, more likely to conform, people with lower self-esteem or insecurity and also those who are more likely to look up to a high status individual. Um, and that's also why in teenagehood, um, in the teenage years, there is a lot of insecurity and you are trying to look up to role models a lot. So that's why uh, during adolescence, conformity is a stronger influence. So in leisure, um, Conformity makes it so that people will follow the lead of others to learn skills, modeling. And, and this can be, um, you know, a positive thing. So, um, you know, for example, um, you know, I've heard of people, you know, who maybe uh, have entered HKR the, um, as a student or a faculty or staff member. And you see how all around you people are more engaged in physical activity and uh, and healthy behaviors. Uh, and let's say maybe you're not as physically active. Well, maybe seeing all of your peers and faculty around you makes you feel more likely to follow and, you know, learn those skills. Um, conformity is also related to things like serious leisure. So identification that occurs in these serious leisure activities. For example, you develop norms of a specialized subgroup. And, you know, think of, for example, summer camp, for those who've gone to summer camp, there's a lot of conformity, you know, you end up doing all the chants, wearing all the colors, doing the, the silly things. Um, and a lot of that is about sense of belonging and, you know, being part of a team, but it's also about identification. Um, and obviously identification is going to be stronger uh, when you have, you know, your different groups. And you can see in childhood, or pardon me, in adolescence, um, a lot of this occurs in leisure activities where groups are formed based on recreation, leisure, and sports. Uh, and identification and conformity then happens within those groups. Conformity also happens, you know, generally in our society with identification with teams, color bearing, chanting, etc. Um, there is, you know, can be, uh, that can be very strong. Now in Canada, in North America, of course, we are, you know, very strong about our, our teams. Um, but for example, uh, you know, this is also happens, um, very much, for example, with soccer, you know, what European football, um, 
for example, when I was in um, Scotland, when I was um, just uh, out of university, um, I, my uh, well boyfriend at the time, we went to um, a pub with a friend who was um, going to teacher's college there. And he told us that we had to change our clothes. And I said, why? And he said, well, you're, I forget what color I was wearing and he was wearing, but anyway, we had colors on that were um, for the opposing team for soccer. And he said that would cause you, you don't want to do that because, you know, you're setting yourself up for maybe like arguments or, and that uh, at the pub, you know, that's how much these colors uh, can matter. Um, and, you know, you see this obviously with like teams and uh, school sports and that sort of thing as well, as well. And there's uh, the importance of messages sent and leisure choice rather than the importance of the activity itself. So that's also about conformity. Sometimes people pick a leisure activity only because they are trying to conform or because of the image that they're trying to give rather than for the actual activity. For example, people might be choosing the right vacation, you know, to show people, or I see this all the time, uh, people having a checklist of all the extracurricular activities they need their kid to do for the proper ones, you know, um, and kind of like ranking them socially um, sometimes, you know, like uh, being elitist about what are good extracurricular activities and not. Um, putting a lot of pressure on kids too. And I don't know if you've heard the expression, keeping up with the Joneses. It means, you know, um, you're trying to keep up your appearance with your neighbors on the street. You know, if they get a, a certain um, car, well, you're going to get an even better one, um, keeping up. And sometimes people do that in their leisure as well. Doing it more as a fad. We then have a social comparison. So social comparison is just that. It's when you're comparing yourself to someone else. People look to others for information about themselves, especially when they are unsure how to behave. So, um, and, you know, we use social comparison all the time, but in achievement situations, especially, and to satisfy needs for self-enhancement. And it's also about, you know, learning. You know, humans are... I don't know if it's good or bad. Part of it's good because we're about learning, but it's also about like, you know, you're ranking yourself to uh, to others. I see this with my children um, when they're playing with friends um, and, uh, you know, for example, noticing that they are not the fastest runner, maybe the last runner, um, my one son, but uh uh, my older son is the fastest. So it's all, you know, ranking of these things or who's the strongest, who can do a cartwheel, etc. cetera, um, and comparing yourself. And I think we do this all the time as humans. Um, you know, even I do as an adult, you know, am I as good a teacher as that person or um, research or uh, am I as good of a mom? So social comparison and comparison to others can be threatening. You know, um, it's not always good to compare. And as we've already talked about before, one way of increasing, you know, self-efficacy, self-determination is by um, not comparing to others, but, you know, looking at improvement um, on your own. The strength of social comparison on behavior is influenced by the personal closeness of the other. So... Um, if you're comparing yourself to a stranger, it's not going to have as big of an influence on you as if it's someone that you know. It's also about the quality of the performance. You know, if someone's like really, really good at something, you're obviously going to be comparing yourself more than perhaps um, if it wasn't as good of a performance. And the relevance of the performance to your own self-concept, meaning Whatever behavior they're doing, if, if that behavior is important to you, then when you socially compare, it's going to have more of an influence on you. So that really is about personal relevancy of the activity is important. Um, 
So the better the other's performance and the closer the relationship, the greater loss of self-esteem in the comparison when the activity is personally relevant. Um, for example, people often compare, you know, siblings. My, my boys are uh, two years uh, apart, and although that's quite a bit at a younger age, they are always, you know, socially you know, comparing, and obviously it really matters to them. Their relationship is close, and if it's about, um, you know, something that they view as they're better at, then it would be very upsetting um, to them, um, you know, to... Um, when, when they're comparing that they're not as good. The better the other's performance and the closer the relationship, the better your self-evaluation um, when the activity is less personally relevant. So um, you when, you're, when things aren't as important to you or matter to your self-esteem or your image or your identity, then um, the social comparison won't be as influential. And I'm sure all of you, like myself, I can think of certain friends, family members, where um, did socially compare, or you know, I don't know if your mother ever used this one, but you know, I always heard, um, I always heard about a, a couple other families and say, well, and you know, in their house, you know, they um, do, you know, three activities, or they do their chores very regularly. You know, from it was basically my mother was trying to make me socially compare in order to improve my behavior. But we have to be careful with that because it can be have negative consequences. Obviously, in sports and competitive activities, it's designed to be com comparative. Success or failure is relative to the performance of others. Um, but we do that in everything, really. Um, I, my, you know, children obviously are learning to read more now and I realize, um, they, you can go online and they now do, a uh, online reading on this one program. And when we're at home, um, they probably shouldn't do this, but, uh, the teachers, but they, they have it ranked on the whole class based on how much reading they've done, um, and uh, anyway, so I can see how my son is comparing. What do I do? You know, I didn't tell him where he stood, but right away, every time I open that page, I look at that. I'm compare. I'm always comparing where he is with the other people in the class. Um, and so we often create competition. And that can detract people from participation. It can act as a constraint. Um, you know, I've, I've been... I, I don't really like going to the gym and, and it's more that I just don't find it enjoyable. It's not that I don't like exercising even. I, 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 I would prefer to exercise by myself at home, but I think that ha is a lot to do with social comparison. I get distracted when I'm at a gym. I look, I'm always looking at other women, looking to see, looking at their body shape, comparing it to mine, trying to figure out what their age might be. You know, um, you know, nothing worse, you know, than seeing someone who is uh, 10, 20 years older, probably who's looking pretty fit, um, you know, so that can detract. And, you know, if I'm going to be honest, I'd probably say that's the main reason that I don't go to a gym and probably a main reason for a lot of other people. It is for my husband. He doesn't like going because uh, of social comparison. Um, it's not just women. And another social influence, which is has a lot of negative consequences, is discrimination and exclusion. So discrimination and exclusion are the behavioral consequences of prejudice and stereotyping. And these are uh, obviously two important um, terms that you need to know. And they're probably familiar. You're probably, I've heard them before. So prejudice is a hostile or negative attitude towards a distinguishable group based on generalizations derived um, from either faculty or incomplete in information. So it is basically making an assumption about, which is a generalization. So you're making assumptions based on a very little bit of information, like 
Um, and then you are, you know, basically have negative attitudes towards that group. Stereotyping is assigning identical characteristics to any person in a group, regardless of the variation among members of that group. Um, so very similar, but it's not about having a negative. So prejudice is a negative attitude. Stereotyping, we often don't, we, we might uh, be not mean to be um, stereotyping or have negative uh, consequences, but even the best human who is a very open person um, to others, et cetera, stereotypes. And again, assigning identical characteristics to all the people um, in a group, regardless of the variation. You know, for example, um, you know, obviously I'm not prejudiced towards um, young adults. I enjoy working with students, university students. But for example, I could stereotype. Maybe I say that all young adults, um, you know, I, there, there's been a stereotype that um, the millennials are self-centered, for example, is something I hear. Um, and, you know, so that could be a stereotype that I assign. And by the way, I don't think millennials are um, self-centered at all. You have a different view on things, but you're much more understanding of the world and around you and uh, are going to make amazing changes. So again, on an exam, make sure you understand the difference between prejudice and stereotyping. And there are common characteristics, you know, that are discriminated against. Um, race and ethnicity, gender, disability status, uh, age. Um, you know, for example, we stereotype uh, based on race and ethnicity for um, different sports. Um, you know, and it's often like kind of, especially if it's a white elitist activity, but I don't want to create, you know, uh, more stereotypes, but, you know, we can think of, um, you know, when you think of golf, a stereotype, it's a rich white guy um, also, or um, Asian, you know, uh, people in Asia just love, you know, all golf. Um, that could be obviously a stereotype, uh, or it could be about, um, the type, you know, food, or I mean, we have many uh, types of stereotypes that we could do, and we often do that. Um, you know, it's not really about race, but for example, um, I don't skate. I'm a Canadian that does not skate, and um, you know, it was it's assumed when I lived in the states. First, common assumption is that my first language is French, uh, and second assumption was like, you know, that we all. Um, it was always snowing, but they just assumed that skating was a big part of my life. You know, pretty mild stereotype, but that's an example. Obviously, there's tons of gender stereotypes. Um, you know, uh, the most common one that I hear um, when I was a kid and also in the playground now, sometimes I hear it. People saying, for example, you throw like a girl. Um, and... Uh, and, you know, so meaning girls are being excluded. I don't know if you've ever seen, a, there's a Dove commercial that shows um, the image of what girls think of when it's when they say, throw like a girl. And all these little girls are eight years old, um, you know, 10, and they're throwing with might and power, Rah! like girl power. Next part of the commercial is um, adults. Same question. They asked men and women, um, what does it mean to throw like a girl? They're all throwing weakly. Wish you could see me now, but you know, like uh, with throwing feebly with weakness. So what happens between the uh, eight-year-old girl who thinks she has girl power and is going to, you know, become a, um, a baseball player and when she's uh, 30 years old, and she thinks throwing it like a girl is weak. You know, that's discrimination and exclusion in leisure based on gender. We can also look at disability status, obviously, always assuming, you know, people look at the disability instead of people's abilities, which should be the focus. We discriminate based on age, um, you know, if you're young girl or you're too old to uh, do a specific activity.
So the influences on leisure. Well, this is a lot about exclusion, excluding people from recreation opportunities. You know, um, although in our society, we're not, there's supposed to be a no, um, you know, it should be equal to all, but that's not actually what always happens. For example, being accepted members of a private club. Um, my parents belong to a country club in uh, Southern Ontario. Uh, it's been around a long time uh, in Kitchener-Waterloo area. Like you to make note that Kitchener-Waterloo um, is, you know, quite an educated area with, because it's got a lot of universities and, um, you know, research and think tanks and all that. Um, there's also a very large international, you know, population diversity. Uh, and so my point is, is there's many people who are uh, people, minorities, visible minorities, people of color who have money and may like golf. But yet when I walk into my parents' club, I've, I've, I only see a few and, and they admit, you know, there's only been a few visible minorities. I don't think that they're excluding them, like they're saying, no, you cannot come to this club. That might have been 100 years ago. But obviously, they're not coming because they don't feel accepted. Somehow, they're being excluded. You could be charging high fees to exclude economically disadvantaged groups. I've seen that before. You know, you don't want low-income people to be coming. Um, so you make it more costly so it's out of reach. Um, or discouraging males from participating in a feminine activity. You know, I, we see that all the time, how, um, you know, oh, like, um, I, you know, my, my son has expressed uh, interest in dance. And uh, I've seen a few, like, eyebrows about that. I mean, um, he, you know, there's lots of male dancers anyway, but for some reason that's viewed as, like, a feminine activity. Again, it's perhaps discriminating or excluding. Again, absence of membership is important. I've already kind of given an example. That make, will make a setting or activity uninviting to that group. So if you note that there's no people with disabilities that belong to a sports club and you have a disability, maybe you think that means you can't go to it because you don't see those people or people of color like I talked about with the club. Or, um, for example, around St. John's um, in our recreation and leisure, um, centers there you see very few people who are visible minorities disabilities etc who are actually staff you know um there's a lot of research to show that having diversity amongst your staff is important in order for people to feel more accepted so those are the social influences uh, on leisure need to understand um, all of those and to be able to distinguish them. So all those social influences can happen at any stage throughout all of life. Obviously, they're a little more influential in, uh, in childhood and adolescence, mostly because we're a little more susceptible to, um, you know, lower self-esteem or um, insecurities and that sort of thing. And you're also trying to figure out you know, who you are, really. But there are other critical influences on leisure orientations in childhood. And they include, obviously, the family, peers, and then there's media and technology. So self-socialization. We've talked about this a little bit. But in childhood, um, children participate in self-socialization, meaning they seek to become a greater part of the world around themselves. It's about them being producers in their own development. So, meaning you might be selecting certain leisure activities as a child or play in order to create who you are. Obviously, a lot of this is probably unconscious. So there is socialization into and through leisure. Uh, a good short answer question would be for you to understand the difference between socialization into versus through and to be able to give, you know, maybe use a leisure example. So socialization into, um, that's basically um, where 
you are being pushed into something, you know, drawn uh, into it. So this is the process by which children acquire motives, attitudes, values, and skills that affect their leisure choices, their behavior, and their experiences throughout their life. So who is most likely to be agents of socialization? Or um, In childhood, obviously, it's parents, siblings, teachers, and coaches are often the largest people, you know, the, the strongest people that socialize children into certain activities. And they can also, um, it's also provides like a climate of socialization. So um, you might have like facilities, programs, natural resources. It, it also depends on that. For example, in Newfoundland, because living on the ocean and the outdoor area, um, kind of like the environment socializes us into leisure. We're maybe more likely um, to be hikers or do, uh, you know, ice fishing, um, snowmobiling, hunt hunting, um, berry picking. You know, it's also about the environment. But examples of myself, you know, I, um, my uh, things that my parents socialized me into was uh, tennis. My parents in, uh, always enjoyed tennis, and that was something that, you know, we used to do as a, a family. And then I got into it, uh, you know, quite seriously in childhood and um, early adolescence. Um, I also think of, you know, I've certainly had a lot of teachers and professors who strongly socialized me into other, uh, into you know, certain things because I wanted to, you know, uh, be like them or I was interested in what they were doing. On the flip side, not only are we as children socialized or pushed into certain leisure, but we also are socialized through leisure. Throughout in leisure, we have leisure socialization. We have then the resource for cultural innovation, social solidarity and personal development. It is through our leisure that we develop skills that we can use in all walks of life, whether it's you know social family life, uh, as well as in our career. And we've talked a lot about these in, in um, other units. For example, play. Play is definitely socializes a child through leisure. They develop you develop creativity, social and cognitive skills. In sports, if you, in childhood or adolescence, if you were involved in a sports team, you were socialized through leisure. You gained the ability to work with others, to have shared goals, maybe to deal with like having different opinions or, you know, having issues on a team. Fundraising, these are all things that might, uh, uh, are things you might use in life. Also, structured leisure activities, let's say, like music or recreation. Um, you know, this is, you know, when you're going to a lesson, for example. Well, that gives you the capacity to direct, control, and focus your attention. You know, um, for example, my children, when they started, they started doing, um, it was called soccer tots. And uh, for my son, um, he was... You know, he was pr not bad with the soccer skills just from play, but the things that he learned in soccer tots, maybe it wasn't soccer, but it was about, you know, um, being with a bunch of kids that he wasn't as familiar with, listening to a coach, following others, make, you know, paying attention, listening skills. Um, you can really see kids listening skills in, uh, in, uh, in activities, you know, if they're running uh, the wrong way or not paying attention. So in leisure, we are socialized through these activities and they prepare us for our future roles. Um, and this is often called professionalization through play. That's what Roger Mandel would call it. But it's also about so being socialized through an activity. Um, with, with, with um, 
children, there's obviously a very strong influence of family um, and parents in particular. And the parenting style can impact children's lifelong leisure patterns. There are three common parenting styles, authoritarian, laissez-faire, and democratic authoritative. Um, it's on the, on a, for examination, it'd be important for you, like on a um, multiple choice or short answer, to be able to, you know, know what each of these are and be able to distinguish them. So authoritarian parents are um, on the one side of the spectrum. So they um, are more into control, not providing a lot of perceived choice or perceived control with their children. So allowing little opportunity for decision making. You know, obedience is important. I'm thinking of, you know, the expression, my way or the highway. Um, and so in this case, maybe the parent is, you know, directing leisure, directing play, you know, um, and the child is not making decisions. Um, you know, I think of my parents-in-law were more authoritarian parents. Um, now they had nine children and I think they needed to be, you know, in order to create uh, some sense of uh, peace and <laughs> uh, order in the household. Um, but, you know, there was, um, you know, certain things that um, activities maybe that were not uh, allowed either. Um, this can reduce children's capacity for self-directed leisure. And that's because if you've grown up um, always kind of being obedient and following what you are supposed to be doing or being told to do, then you yourself don't really, you haven't exercised how to make good decisions for yourself. At the other end of the spectrum um, is the laissez-faire. Um, laissez-faire uh, children, uh, or parents, pardon me, are much more, you know, um, l letting the child be, uh, have kind of no boundaries, really. So leaving children to their own devices, giving them a lot of freedom. Um, and this is often then can, maybe there's even no rules. And, I, and I'm not talking... I'm, I'm talking about being quite whatever you want to do, parents. So, you know, think of, um, I'm thinking of you know, some parents I know who, um, maybe they didn't do this now, but, you know, uh, friends of mine when they were kids, you know, they might have, um, you know, basically were put out the door in the morning in the summer and, you know, um, told to come home at a certain time and, you know, they didn't know uh, what they were doing or what they were up to. Um, this can be very freeing, but absence of structure can stress children out. It can reduce ability to have positive experiences. And that's because, we, as we've talked, discussed before, children especially like rules. They want boundaries. They want to understand um, what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior. And they actually feel security and safety in those rules. That doesn't mean you can't give choice. It just is about boundaries. So laissez-faire is at the other end. In the middle, we have democratic authoritative. So uh, this is more, as it says, in the democratic. Uh, they're more uh, a voting democracy system. So this is about treating children as if they're capable of decision making, giving them choices, but providing limits, guidelines, and direction. And this really then encourages independence. It gives children feelings of security and confidence. And all of this will lead, I think, to better problem solving and self-determination as adults. My parents were definitely democratic authoritative. Um, I certainly, well, they used uh, what we've already talked about, the illusion of choice theory <laughs> or illusion of, illusion of control. Um, for example, in leisure, um, you know, basically they looked at like fall, uh, winter and summer, we kind of looked at the three, kind of three seasons, because that's the three seasons of, of sports and recreation. And, um, basically, um, there was, you know, for example, I always had to do music every year. Um, and, 
uh, I think my parents thought that, you know, it taught discipline, you know, having to practice, etc. cetera. Um, now, so that wasn't something that I had choice in actually. But then after that, it was always like, well, you need, you have to always have a, a winter activity and a, a summer activity, like physical activity. So I was often allowed, you know, kind of to have some choices about some of the things that I wanted. But there wasn't a choice that I, um, you know, my parents made me be physically active. But I was allowed to help in the decision making of what those things would be. Okay, so for parenting styles, then remember, you've got authoritative at the other end is your laissez faire. And in the middle are the parents who are, um, you know, they're kind of uh, doing a bit of each. They're giving choice, but they're providing limits. The influence of family can also, and especially parents, can also lead to what's called hurried children in today's society. Um, Dr. Mannell, one of the, uh, the authors, my mentor, he's looked at this uh, quite a bit. And, you know, children are growing up very quickly, more than they used to. They, peop, uh, children are missing out on the ease and leisure of childhood. A lot of this has to do with overstructuring of time. Um, some of this is a result of societal changes. For example, um, more and more there, for example, if it's uh, women or Working usually now, you know, it's not your uh, two parent, one, um, one employed household anymore. Often a lot of um, single parents who, you know, frankly, just don't have as much time um, to uh, be, be doing things, maybe need things to be structured. Um, and, you know, but that all leads to hurrying. We also know we have children who, you know, they're constantly doing something you know like monday is music and tuesday is this activity and this activity and on saturday they're going to learn german um uh we, um, you may have been one a, a child like this um or or no of uh, friends and not that that's not great but that basically is creating like a job-like experience for children when um and when you're totally overstructured you're never making your own choices you're not learning how to play and do things on your own so children can experience responsibility overload uh change overload and emotional overload and um, this can create anxiety and personally i i've seen this more and more as a as a prof over the years i started in 2006 and, you know, I've seen um, the different cohorts over the years. And I do notice um, that in a more, you know, your uh, generation seems to be a lot more overstructured. And there's also is a lot more sense of anxiety and, you know, unknowing of things and a lot more pressures. So as I've always talked about why do we have this hurried children problem as I already mentioned both parents are working or you have a single parent home parents hurry um, you know sometimes um, adults are also trying to keep up with the Joneses and make sure they're going to their yoga class and this thing and that thing um, parents might have a desire for a higher standard of living like working more and and maybe that's a, a real thing or, you know, when they're wanting to provide more for their children's future. But that could also be about, you know, um, just, you know, maybe not living within your means and having to get jobs or, you know, trying to have the best car or TV or whatever. Um, there's high expectations and increased um, features for, for parents. You know, it's the age of anxiety for parents. Um, you know, when I was born, there was like maybe one book that my mom could have read about parenting. Um, your, some of your parents or grandparents might have had it. It was, um, oh, not Dr. Stork. I can't remember right now, pardon me. Um, but, you know, that's what my mom referred to. Where when, like I was, a, when I was uh, becoming a parent, you know, and pregnant, there was, you know, there's a massive section of the, um, you know, the bookstore is devoted to pregnancy and child. There's all these developmental books, shows you can watch oh on and on and you're told every moment about how what you're supposed to be doing for your child and in order to be a good parent so that creates anxieties 
So on one hand, parents are led uh, to restrict the freedom in order to protect their children, while they're also expecting that leisure choices have physical, social, and psychological advantages. It's all about outcomes now. Um, you know, are the, is the child learning? We can't just have play. For example, at a daycare, um, there was uh, a daycare that um, uh, someone who was working for the Minister of, um, of Health and uh, at his son's daycare, uh, parents were um, writing in to say they wanted to remove outside playtime for the daycare because it didn't, what was the learning outcomes of that? Now, luckily, other uh, parents believed in outside play. Um, and I guess the learning outcomes is like, are, they're not learning their ABCs when they're outside. <laughs> so um, anyway, the government person, like he had masters in uh, physical education and, you know, he got the other parents together, talked to them and, you know, he educated the daycare and the other parents about all the benefits of play and unstructured activity, especially for daycare. Um, obviously, siblings uh, in childhood are very influential, and they can be just as or even more influential as parents. We all look up to our often our older siblings. I I, I am the older sibling, and I know this. Um, even in in my life, I often think of myself as I'm a role model, and you know what would you know what would happen if my sister saw me doing this? You know, it keeps me in check. Um, but older siblings really provide the closest models for fun, for skill development and activity involvement. And I'm sure many of you, like if you've had an older sibling, if you've gotten into an activity, you're my, you know, you've kind of followed. So besides, uh, well, siblings are very much like peers, but they're even stronger because they're different. But obviously in childhood, we also have the influence of peers. And this is a uh, shared play in children. So shared play uh, can be uh, motivated by association with others. You know, you want to be related, feel a sense of belonging. Shared play and shared leisure is also biologically directed. As I've talked about, you know, some of these infant monkey studies, humans have a need to be social. So peers as role models often offer examples for competence. You know, you're comparing yourself physically, socially, and emotionally to peers. And this is, you know, happens a lot in childhood. So this is really about relatedness or association with others. It increases as a leisure motivation as children grow older. So as, you know, especially uh, when you're, let's say, in grade one, you know, you do care about being related. But as you grow older and, you know, enter around, um, you know, 12, 13 and into adolescence, being feeling a sense of belonging is very, very strong leisure motivation. And I don't know if you have, but, you know, I certainly um, joined some activities in my high school just to um, feel a sense of relatedness. And, you know, I can remember um, one was, I don't know why, I thought I'd, I'd like to, but some of these musicians that um, were in my high school and I found them interesting to talk to. And I, I liked music too, but, you know, I wasn't the best guitar player and I had a classical guitar. But for example, I joined the blues guitar club just so that I could feel that and you know I was not very good at it I was out of my league and and you know quit after a couple of days but looking back you know my motivation had nothing to do with music it was about feeling related um and this is obviously families most influential about this in the younger children but peers it becomes very important especially in teenagehood So there's many examples of peer influence on leisure. Um, some like peers uh, motivated boys to be involved in sport. It's very common, um, you know, as an example, um, I have, uh, although I have put my son in skating lessons, um, we've, I don't want to be a hockey family. 
um, or hockey mom, and I'm not, um, you know, also hockey is an expensive sport. So, you know, as a parent, I've decided I decided I'm not going to do hockey. Skating, yes. Um, which, you know, and then if he decides he wants to do hockey. But uh, a colleague of mine said, good luck on that. You know, uh, might be okay now, but a lot of kids, when they get a bit older, they get into hockey, especially boys, because all of their friends are doing it. And, you know, um, I can even see that a bit, you know, at my son's class, you know, who plays hockey and who doesn't. Family often initially motivate girls to be involved in sport, which is good, but participating with friends is what keep, keeps girls participating. Um, if for, especially for teenagers, if there is not a social activity to sport or whatever it is they're doing, it does not provide them like with that need of relatedness. So it's uh, very important. So, you know, girls are much more likely to stay in sports, you know, if their friends are involved in it as well. And labels um, that we used in high school to identify groups of peers, uh, you know, we rank, we have different statuses. These are often based on involvement in extracurricular activities. Um, I've mentioned this before when we talked about identity, um, but when, like, for example, in my high school, I can think of the jocks and the drama kids and the music, and then there was, um, you know, the kind of hippie environmental ones and um, you know, it was very much based on extracurricular activities uh, and, and group identification. So those are different influences then that uh, peers can have. I'm going to end that there for now. Next class, we'll talk about the influence of media uh, and technology uh, as influences in childhood and then discuss some of the social influences in adulthood.